we all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, this session is on the new Santa Clara principles. Um, let me take my mask off, there we go. Um, we're going to be presenting the new principles, talking about our consultation process that we've undertaken uh, over the past almost two years now. Um, and we've got some remote participants who are going to join us to discuss various aspects of this process um, and of the principles themselves. So welcome, uh, if you're here for this session. So first, I just want to start by introducing the principles, a little bit of their history um, and what the new the new principles represent. Uh, in 2018, a group of people on the sidelines of a conference in California came together to create a set of principles um, that would seek to push companies to be more transparent in their content moderation and policy making practices. Those principles were launched, um, so three years ago now, and over time we, we received a lot of positive feedback. We were effective in getting a number of companies, including some of the biggest ones, Facebook or Meta, uh, Twitter, Reddit, uh, YouTube, and as well as a few others to endorse the principles. Um, and we got Reddit to actually comply with the principles in full. These principles focused on three primary areas, numbers, notice, and appeal. So transparency around the numbers of, of content removals and other, other aspects um, of, of moderation. Notice, so notice to users, um, just letting them know when they violated a rule and how they can uh, effectively appeal that. And then of course, appeals, ensuring that every system had a robust appeals process um, so that users could access remedy. We also received a lot of feedback about the principles, that there were pieces that we'd missed, um, that there were other, other elements that our, our allies around the world hoped that we would have. And as such, we embarked in, I believe, beginning in December 2019, uh, so two years ago now, on a process to do a full consultation with various people around the world, and David will talk about that in, in a moment. So without further ado, I'm just going to introduce the, the new principles, and you can find these at santaclaraprinciples.org if you'd like to read along. Are you putting them on the screen? Yes. So first, we start with a set of foundational principles, and we'll have someone talk about why we chose that, uh, that particular mode a little bit later on. Our first foundational principle focuses on human rights and due process and says that companies should ensure that human rights and due process considerations are integrated at all stages of the content moderation process and of course should be transparent about outlining how that integration is made. The second focuses on understandable rules and policies. Um, of course, that companies should publish clear and precise rules and policies relating to the actions that they take with respect to users' uh, content and accounts and have those policies be accessible in an, uh, or available in an easily accessible and centralized location. I think everyone's experienced certain platforms that shall remain nameless where it's really hard to find and follow the rules. Um, and third, their cultural competence. Um, this one I think will resonate with a lot of people and it was probably the number one thing that we, we heard in our, cons in our uh, global consultation process um, that companies need to ensure that, that the people making moderation appeal decisions understand the language, the culture, the political and social context of the posts that they're moderating, which unfortunately is still not the fact at most of these platforms. Um, we've seen through the, the recent leaks how uneven um, a lot of this moderation is, particularly when it comes to language. Uh, so that's, an oh no, there we go. That's another incredibly important element of this process. Um, and of course, there's more detail in that that you can see on the website. Four, state involvement in com content moderation. The company should recognize the particular risks to users' rights that result from state involvement in content moderation processes. Again, I would say here that we've seen an uptick in demands for removal of political speech and other key speech over the past few years from certain countries, and some companies are all too uh, happy to comply with those demands. Um, so this will also include things like a state's involvement in the development enforcement of a company's rules and policies, um, and that special concerns are raised by demands and requests from state actors. 
And then the fifth foundational principle is integrity and explainability. We want companies to ensure that their content moderation systems, including both their automated and their non-automated processes, um, work reliably and effectively. And then finally, we also have uh, operational principles. The first um, two are the same, or sorry, the first three are the same, although they're much uh, expanded from the previous from previous notions. Um, so again, that focuses on number, notice, and appeals. I won't get into the details there um, for, sa for the, the sake of time, but you can read uh, in detail on the site, which um, we've got on the screen right now as well. Um, and then finally, we've added two new components, principles for governments and other state actors. So first, we want to ensure that governments and other state actors uh, are removing barriers to transparency by companies. Um, we know that often, you know, I think China is the most famous example of this, but we know that, that some governments do place um, restrictions on what companies are allowed to publish about their own requests to them. And then the second is the promotion of government transparency, that governments and other state actors should themselves report their involvement in content moderation decisions, um, including data on demands or requests for content to be actioned or an account suspended, uh, broken down by the legal basis for the request. So that's just a basic summary of the principles themselves. We'll get more into detail as we discuss how these can be implemented. Um, so I'll turn it over to David now for more information about our consultation, our two-year consultation process. <clears throat> Thank you, Jillian. Um, I also wanted to point out that we do have um, several uh, representatives of the organizations that were uh, co-authors of of the principles who are participating uh, remotely, and I'm going to also invite them to uh, to join in uh, as well. And so, just in the order they're appearing on my screen, uh, uh, Spandana Singh from uh, Open Technology Institute, uh, Caitlin Bogus from Center for Democracy and Technology, Richard Wingfield from Global Digital Partners, Gracia Macias <clears throat> from uh, R3D, um, and let's see, I know I saw some others as well. Um, our colleague, uh, Viridiata Alamante, I thought I saw Laura hecht Falea from uh, um, Brennan Center as well. Um, and if I've missed anybody, please, um, please raise your hand and speak up. Uh, I think one of the most ambitious things about this reimagining of the Santa Clara principles was, was this global open consultation uh, process that, um, that led up to this revision. We really, uh, it was really important to try and get as much feedback as possible about the existing principles and what they're and what was missing in them from as many as many concerned people in the world as possible. And when we started planning this, it was before the pandemic, and we really had envisioned using a lot of the international conferences, such as this one and RightsCon, to really have places to gather people and have you know have in-person meetings um, where we'd be taking notes and have these you know, very spontaneous discussions. And, and obviously uh, the pandemic made that much more difficult, but even so we were really pleased with, the, with, what, with what happened. Not only did we receive um, a lot of written submissions from around the world, but we actually uh, also did have, um, have partners around the world conduct, um, conduct regional sessions uh, uh, virtually, um, but to, but really focused on what were the specific concerns in their region. So we had we had consultations um, in Latin America for, for folks on Latin America, uh, American concerns. We had uh, we had America's consultation. We had an Africa uh, consultation. Um, we had a consultation in India, one focused on Europe, uh, on Europe as well. Um, and these all proved to be tremendously valuable uh, in providing input. I'm going to I'm going to ask um, Vladimir Cortez from Article 19 who is here uh, to talk about this process as well, uh, since um, he was involved both in helping to plan the uh, Latin American consultation, as well as reviewing a lot of the inputs from these consultations as well. So Vladimir. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, David, uh, Gillian. It's an uh, honor to be here uh, finally after this two years, uh, two years process, and uh, uh, finally presenting this uh, very rich and uh, uh, very uh, special debate and the processes that we uh, reviewed during uh, this uh, consultation period, consultation time, 
uh, we from Article 19, Mexico and Central America, were supporting these big effort from uh, Electronic Frontier Foundation and uh, some other organizations to begin the, the dialogue, to look at the context, to look at what uh, were the needs in uh, not just in Mexico, but in other parts of, uh, of Latin America, and uh, then start reviewing and knowing what was also part of the reflections and discussions and uh, inputs uh, from other parts of the world. So it was really uh, like interesting to know what were like the focus and what were like the uh, reflections from uh, Taiwan, what were like the reflections in India, what were like the uh, inputs and what were like uh, the things that most worried organizations and other stakeholders in different parts of the world. So it was the chance not just like to look of what is what has up, what was happening in, in our region, but also like expanding more uh, these uh, particularly uh, things that worries uh, uh, different stakeholders when we refer to content moderation. And then after that, it was uh, like uh, looking at the uh, things that we agree, the things that we uh, uh, believe it was like needed to incorporate in the news, uh, in the Santa Clara Principles 2.0 uh, version. And what were the things in which we have to have like a broader uh, discussion. What are the things that we can request to, uh, to social media companies? And what are the, the lines or the limits in which we can request certain kind of information because it will uh, create a risk in terms, for example, on, on privacy. It's like, okay, we can request a certain information, but we have also to think in other uh, aspects and other elements as, uh, uh, as requesting certain uh, type of, of data. And from our particularly uh, interest uh, from, from Mexico uh, and uh, with other organizations as Grecia Macias, it's here from uh, the uh, Red and Defensa de los Derechos Digitales, the network to the defense of digital rights, was, was what was about like the relation between states and social media companies. We uh, understand and we believe that there uh, need to be more transparency on what is this uh, particularly uh, relation, what uh, institutions from the states are requesting social media uh, companies to take down certain information, and to know if uh, these are accompanied by uh, certain uh, legal orders if uh, it's just like uh, someone from the state being mentioned in a critical uh, journalistic piece and they want to just take down this information because it uh, affects his image or, or so on. So it's like the, the need to know more about uh, this information. Just to mention, Mexico in the last years have requested to social media companies like Facebook, Google, and Twitter around 30,000 uh, takedown requests. We need it uh, to be more transparent. We need to have like more information about it. And the new Santa Clara principles introduce this uh, uh, transparency uh, elements that are uh, relevant and are important, at, not just for social media companies, but also to insist and to strengthen the work on transparency that states must comply in order to understand this uh, relation and in order to protect freedom of expression and access to information. So I will just uh, let uh, there uh, saying that it was like a, a really uh, incredible effort from different uh, organizations to have the consultation, to have the dialogue, and to continue reinforcing uh, transparency and accountability to all uh, the stakeholders and put again in the center uh, users and uh, protect their freedom of expression and the access to information. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Vladimir. That was really helpful context. Um, and I appreciate hearing your perspective on it. Uh, sorry, regional perspective on it. Um, the next thing we'd like to do is talk a little bit about the implementation of the principles and what we're looking for from various stakeholders, um, from advocates to governments to um, the companies themselves. And so to that end, we've created a set of toolkits. Um, these are available on the website. They're under implementation guides. Um, we have a toolkit for advocates, one for companies, and a note for regulators. 
Um, so I'd like to, should I turn it over to Gracia? Yeah, I'd like to turn it over to Gracia, Gracia, if you're there on Zoom, uh, to talk a little bit about that process, which you were heavily involved in. And we're also just going to share uh, on the website as we go. Sure. Thank you so much, Ilian. Um, I'm so happy to be here today and to be um, to see the new Santa Clara principles finally published uh, after all the work that has been uh, done for this. So yeah, we um, we decided to make some toolkits for the implementation of these of these principles because uh, to give like some kind of orientation for the main actors involved in that will be involved in the uh, with the Santa Clara principles. Um, a fun fact, at first, uh, the note for regulators was supposed to be a uh, toolkit, but uh, when we were drafting uh, drafting the the note, David and I uh, realized that more than a toolkit, it, it was more uh, like a note to don't do this, please, do, do, do not use the Santa Clara principles as, um, as like legislation. There's some caveats that you have to 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 take in consideration, such as the, your own regional legislation, your own, um, for example, framework of, of international treaties. Uh, it's not the same to apply to take the Santa Clara principles in context, for example, of the U.S. rather than here in Mexico City, in, in Mexico or in other countries or countries from Latin America, especially because we have a different human rights framework. Uh, so yeah, if we we tried to talk about that, we talked. To, uh, we wanted to talk about the scale that um, that, that w you don't have to uh, to remind the the regulators that they, that there are different kind of companies, and there are some of them that will only meet one one of the principles, and and other that will meet all of them, and that's okay. It depends of the size and number of users, the capitalization, and another a lot of factors that they have to take in consideration. And another thing that we were talking about is uh, the potential for exploitation in case that, uh, well, and we have seen that, <laughs> it, like Vladimir was just uh, talking about here, here in Mexico, uh, what, there has been nefarious intents to, um, to try to use some uh, of of regulation, in, including like kind of using the Santa Clara principles to make to um, impact the 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 free and competitive internet that we all want to have, and that also that the there is a constantly evolving landscape regarding the, the internet that, that there is you cannot freeze some legislation in time and not to expect. That that it have to that that such legislation will have to change in few years. The other toolkit that we uh, developed was about uh, uh, for advocacy, especially because it's I, we know that it's hard to deal with um, with some of the of the key um, actors of of targets or, or that are involved in the implementation of the principles. For example, like we just talked about state actors. And we, uh, first of all, we, we just like make some principle of that uh, to tell the state actors that they, may, that they must abstain from passing legislation that hinders freedom of speech and the internet and share human rights. And to also take in consideration um, uh, the the note for regulators and that these are not intended to be a template for regulation because we know that you give uh, some legislators a thing and they want just to copy and paste and that's not uh, as simple as that. The other thing was how to uh, engage with social media platforms and how we communicate with such platforms and also um, to uh, encourage we encourage the members of civil society well civil society to work. Uh, and also companies and other stakeholders to work together to develop implementation plans in consultation with stakeholders and especially to develop a roadmap to the variance of the revised principles. Uh, and also we give like some tips to 
of, of how we can use this Santa Clara principles in our advocacy, like building visibility, like like I just said, uh, mentioning that the, these uh, principles exist and this, explaining the history and the rebel, relevance of of taking in consideration these principles when talking about account moderation, organizing face-to-face -face meeting with companies, and also face-to-face uh, -face discussion with relevant state, state actors and 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 facilitating target actions toward directors of the companies and also to hold a press conference to explain this the Santa Clara principles to show new evidence of issues experienced in social media platforms and using all these opportunities to engage in new conversations where we can uh, especially in each country or each legislation or in each context um, develop uh, more uh, more beneficial guidelines for freedom of speech and human rights in the internet scope. And the other one, and the last one, the, the last toolkit that we made is the toolkit for companies uh, that it's meant to explain to the uh, different companies how to also uh, uh, implement these, kind, these principles to provide insight of how uh of, of how it should be implemented and the good practices that should be taken in consideration and also uh to explain the operational uh principles and to that set out the specific specific practices for companies and in, in when respect with different stages and aspects of the con content moderation processes and also we give like um some we call to action to platforms to recognize the growing demand of, for more transparency from their users and from civil society and how these kind of principles will help to um, nourish a more free and uh, human rights center internet so yeah that's basically the the the, the general idea for the toolkits Well, thank you so much, uh, Gracia. I wanted to bring in uh, Richard Wingfield at this point. What are the big changes between the original Santa Clara principles and the new version is the introduction of foundational principles. And I'd like to ask Richard to talk about why that decision was made and, and just tell us a little bit more about, about these foundational principles and how and what their value is. Absolutely. And it's, it's wonderful to be with you virtually, if, if not in, in person today. And it's been a real pleasure being part of, of this process. As we were looking through the feedback that was received from consultation events, which has been noted took place, I think, in pretty much every region of the world and with a broad range of civil society, academic and, and private sector um, consultees, a lot of the themes that we were seeing emerge from some of those consultation responses really cut across a number of the existing uh, principles, the three principles that were found in the first iteration of the SCPs. And as we were trying to think through how do we incorporate some of these, feed, these pieces of feedback and some of these recommendations that people are making into the existing principles, we found it quite difficult at times to, to work out where precisely they would fit, because some of the themes seemed to cut across all of them. So we began to sort of try to group together a number of recommendations into broader categories, I suppose you could say, which have ultimately become the, the foundational principles. And we drew inspiration from the idea of having foundational principles uh, from uh, another instrument, um, the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, uh, which sets out foundational principles and then operational principles when it's talking about the roles and responsibilities of, of governments and, and the private sector to respect human rights. So as a, as a result of drawing inspiration from, from other documents that, that set out sort of principles uh, for companies, we then look to see how best to develop foundational principles uh, in a way which be constructive and useful. And I think if you look at the new version of the SCPs, you'll see a difference between the way the foundational principles are drafted and the operational principles that, that, which build upon the three original ones. One of the big differences between the two is that the, the operational principles set very clear and, and sort of demanding and quite rightly so demanding expectations of the very largest platforms and intermediaries now when it comes to transparency. But we wanted to make sure that the SCPs uh, weren't only relevant for the largest companies, but would provide a source of guidance and inspiration for companies of all sizes that were looking to, to be more transparent. And so the foundational principles, and this is one of the things that I particularly like about them, 
are drafted in a way that any company can look to them as a source of inspiration as to how they should be undertaking their work in contrast to the, to the operational ones, which are a little bit more uh, demanding and concrete in terms of the expectations. The other difference between the foundational principles and the others is that the foundational principles are drafted with a principle first and then some detail around implementation. Uh, and we drew inspiration for this approach from, from another document that many people here will be familiar with, probably the uh, uh, Global Network Initiative uh, principles, which also contain implementation guidelines. So that distinction between the principle, which is essentially the sort of the value that we believe should be embedded uh, and recognized by the company, and then implementation, as in how do you translate that value into a concrete mechanism internally or some kind of process or structure to, to reflect it in practical terms. So that's a little bit about the background of, as to why we decided to introduce these foundational principles uh, and, and the structure that they, that they take. Um, if it's okay, I'd like to just briefly go, th go through them all. And I know that David did so at the, mo at the start, but perhaps I can elaborate a little bit on, on why we ended up with these five. By far and away, sort of one of the most important pieces of feedback that we got was the importance of embedding human rights throughout uh, all aspects of transparency. And of course, in many ways, uh, a corporate uh, responsibility to respect human rights in the context of, app of, on of online platforms really does necessitate transparency over what's going on. A lot of people also felt that due process, which is, which is a concept known in many legal traditions, was also important so that decisions were fair. So the first, and, and, and we made deliberately made it the very first foundational principle, is that recognition that human rights really underpins everything that happens. And so a strong embedding of human rights and due process into all companies' operations, but particularly uh, content moderation decisions, decisions and transparency around it was, was important in our eyes to be the first. We then look at understandable rules and policies and, and a number of pieces of feedback from the consultation uh, looked not just at the content decisions that were made by companies, so, so looking at the sort of principles around numbers and appeals, but the policies in the first place, a lack of clarity, a lack of availability in relevant languages, uh, ambiguities that made it difficult for users to know uh, what was not wasn't allowed uh, or, or gave too much discretion to content moderators themselves. So we decided to introduce a foundational principle around the rules and the policies themselves, which almost goes without saying, but, but wasn't actually said in the original version of, of the principles. For those of, of you who are sort of looking at how the UN guiding principles should be understood by online platforms, particularly freedom of expression, a lot of work by people like David Kay has emphasized that whereas states have a duty to make sure they have clear, precise laws around uh, freedom of expression, so companies should have clear and precise rules and policies. And so this really is a good way of translating some of that uh, language or some of those expectations from the right to freedom of expression into, into the transparency process. Cultural competence, as David said, was perhaps also one of the most uh, widely um, provided pieces of feedback. And I think it goes without saying, and in fact, we see reports of it all the time, that the lack of understanding of different languages, of different dialects, of different cultural factors in different parts of the world is a huge barrier to fair and human rights-based content moderation. Uh, not to mention the fact that, that, that it, it, transparency is often not even available in, in multiple languages, but often only in English. So the cultural competence foundational principle really tries to emphasize this point to make sure that if you are going to operate your platform to users across the world and offer your services in these languages, you need to make sure that your content moderation process is as good in those languages as perhaps the language where your company is based. And, and, in, and in many cases, that will be in English. So we've emphasized that there and hope that this can be a sort of a, a, a further nudge to many companies who, who either have uh, reduced in levels of investment in, in particular parts of the world, fewer moderators, a lack of understanding of, of differences, not only of languages, but within languages of different dialects and, and, and forms of languages to really ensure that those parts of the world are not left behind as they move forward in improving their content moderation processes. The fourth is state involvement, which has already been mentioned, and you'll see the relevance of governments come to fruition in a number of ways in the new principle. So not only is the, the relevance of governments listed here in the foundational principles, but you'll also see that some of the operational ones make particular reference to the role of governments. And there are, of course, principles for governments and regulators as well. 
So it's impossible now to talk about company transparency without thinking about governments involving themselves in corporate uh, decision making, regulating companies to mandate particular removals or retentions of, of, of pieces of content. And so we really wanted to make clear that companies should be particularly uh, transparent when it comes to what governments are doing and the demands that they're making uh, of those companies themselves. And then finally, integrity and explainability. And there was some back and forth uh, during the consultation process as to the role of automation and or automated decision making, which we know is a huge part of content moderation now, and how far we should go into detail as to how companies should be transparent about the use of automated processes and machine learning. One of the ways we've done this is through this fifth foundational principle, which uh, requires companies to make sure that all of their decisions are explainable. Uh, and this is particularly important when you've got the involvement of, of uh, machine learning or non-human uh, processes in the content moderation decision. So we've included that fifth foundational principle there to make sure that throughout the entire life cycle of content moderation, from setting rules to appeals and beyond, that there is an understanding and explainability of what is happening and why. Very happy to answer, sort of answer any more questions that we have later, but otherwise, um, hopefully that's given you a bit of a flavour as to to how we landed on the foundational principles and their wording. Thank you, Richard. Um, I now want to bring in uh, Spandy Singh uh, to talk about one of the other products that is being launched today is, the, is a report that summarizes the whole uh, global op uh, open consultation. And I'm going to ask Spandy to, to talk about the report for a bit. Thanks, David. Um, so like David mentioned, the report summarizes uh, the feedback that we received from the uh, sort of live virtual uh, consultations that we held, as well as the written submissions that we received. Um, and I would really encourage folks to take a look at the report as you read through the principles and the toolkits as well, because I think that the report has some really rich insights, which reflect how perceptions on transparency and accountability um, have evolved since 2018 and how they're evolving in different regions and communities. It's definitely not homogenous. Um, I think I definitely learned a lot about how different stakeholders uh, are viewing transparency and accountability efforts. Um, and I think going forward, the report can also provide very interesting um, insights to you know, companies who are trying to think through how can they improve their transparency efforts, advocates who are thinking through how they can launch uh, you know, more refined advocacy efforts, and policymakers who are trying to understand how the space is evolving over time. Great, thanks, Bandy. Um, I do, I, I think all of us who are involved in the process will say that we learned a lot. Um, you know, I, and I think all of us involved in the process, I think also consider ourselves to be experts in this area. Um, but I, we all, I think we all said we all learned a lot from the, the feedback we received. It was, it was all very high level, all very well informed, uh, all really uh, specific to the cultural concerns uh, of, of the participants. And, and, and I think it was, it was way more beneficial than I think we'd ever even would hoped it would be. And again, we do recommend uh, that you, that you read the report to see that. And, and importantly, the report includes feedback that ultimately did not make it into the principles as well. We thought it was important uh, to include that as well. Um, there were a lot of, um, uh, you know, uh, people's concerns are, are, are very different all, all over the place. And, I, and I, we, we think it really captured that. One of the issues that was, um, that we had to confront, and I think I've, at IGF, I've been, I've, seen a lot of uh, introduction of principles and, and, and one of the challenges to all of them is, is the problems of scale. And um, one of the big changes between, uh, from the original Santa Clara principles to this version is that the original Santa Clara principles were minimum standards. Um, and these Santa Clara principles, the new version no longer are. They are, they are simply standards. Um, what we found, what our suspicion was and, which, and what was confirmed by the feedback we received was that by setting minimum standards, we really were setting minimum standards for a very few companies um, and not standards that were really widely applicable um, to, to, most online, to most online services. So why, so why it was really valuable to be able to judge whether some very large 
large and well-capitalized uh, companies were complying, it was their, uh, the relevance as benchmarks to, to other um, services uh, was, was less clear. And so the decision was made, uh, and, and again, everyone confronts this problem at scale, the decision was made uh, that these should just be standards, they're benchmarks, um, and that many companies should actually be doing more um, and but many uh, many this should be what they what they aspire to, but maybe not what they're ready to do, not what they're ready to do yet. And, and as Richard said, you know, the foundational principles are really things that could be implemented uh, from the very start. We do think it's important that there be due process by design from the beginning, even when a company is brand new um, and, and has very few resources or, or few users. It's important to be thinking about the due process concerns in the beginning. Uh, but we did realize that. On the one hand, in adding so much to so much detail to the operational principles, um, that we that it would be unrealistic to expect many companies to to comply with these right right away. So, um, so yes, Jillian, I, sure. Do you want to take that? Yeah. <laughs> the, Hybrid models are fun. Um, <laughs> the other element that's new this time around, um, as you may have noticed uh, for watchers of these principles, um, is that this is the first time that we've included principles that are directed at states. Um, and this is in recognition of the very real role that states play in both restricting transparency initiatives by companies, um, as well as uh, in restricting content an actioning content, let's say. Um, and so as such, we found that it was really vital to ensure that we're not just targeting companies in this, um, but that we're also looking at the problem holistically. And I think that, um, you know, it is our hope that the toolkit, uh, the note to regulator, or sorry, the toolkit toward advocates um, helps in both finding paths to, uh, to, to advocate toward companies around the principles, but also toward states. And we'd, uh, I think we'll bring in uh, Caitlin Vogus at this point from CDT, just to, to give uh, uh, her impressions of, of reporting and CDT's impressions are in, I'm not of the report, but of the new principles. Thanks so much, David. Um, I'm standing in for my colleague, Emma Alonzo today, who um, wishes she could be here, but unfortunately had another engagement and um, represented CDT in the work on the revised Santa Clara principles. And I just wanted to um, you know, emphasize a point that Gracia made earlier about the note to regulators and how the principles are not intended to stand in for uh, model legislation or be adopted wholesale into regulation. And I think um, you know, one of the things about transparency is that there can often be some tensions and trade-offs around transparency, um, whether that's things like David was just mentioning issues of scale and burdening smaller companies or overwhelming users with a lot of information that they might not find useful. And those types of tensions and trade-offs were all things that the groups working on the revised principles had to think about and discuss. And they're also things that lawmakers have to think about and discuss when they are trying to regulate for transparency. But the conversations there are happening in two very different contexts. It's very different when civil society organizations are negotiating voluntary recommendations and when lawmakers or policymakers are negotiating laws and regulations. And so I think that emphasis to policymakers in the note to regulators that this is not model legislation, that this is not intended to be adopted as law is very important um, because we have seen attempts to do that with the first Santa Clara principles around the world and also um, in the US in some, in some state laws that are now coming forward um, with transparency requirements. So that was one thing that was very um, important to CDT and definitely a learning experience as we were working with the other groups on this process. Hey, thank you, Caitlin. Um, I think what the other, what the other decisions, um, there were a, a lot of, um, from the global consultation, there were, in terms of transparency reporting, um, there were a lot of requests for very, very highly specific information. And uh, I think a, a lot of, but we realized that um, while we understood why these requests were being made um, in terms of sort of reporting things like, you know, racial information about, about users, um, that they also presented um, 
they also presented actually countervailing uh, user privacy interests. And we certainly didn't want to be in a position where the principles were being used as a justification for companies to collect more information about users than they should collect or, or, or otherwise would collect. Um, I'm going to ask Spandy if she can talk a little bit about this more with the idea that I did not warn her I was going to ask her to talk about this ahead of time. So, um, Spandy, but I know that you were, this was something that was of a special concern to you. So I wonder if you can speak. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I think um, it was interesting to see how granular some of the requests for transparency reporting were. And I think that they reflect um, really concerns from advocates from around the world that platform content moderation practices and tools are discriminatory and are harmful to very specific communities. Um, you know, we, we received a range of requests and many of these are outlined in the report, including a breakdown of like, uh, the racial background of different users, gender, like other uh, sort of affiliations. And I think that the, the intent behind wanting to know that data is really uh, very clear, especially in today's world. But like David mentioned, asking companies to collect this data also opens up a whole other can of worms, you know, without appropriate safeguards to ensure that they're not using this data for other purposes like ad targeting um, or, you know, other algorithmic uses. And I think this is definitely an area of platform transparency where we're seeing more movement happening and perhaps um, companies can't collect or report on this, these kinds of issues through a transparency report, but perhaps there are other ways that they can share more sensitive information um, or impact it, or information on impact of their content moderation processes with smaller groups like researchers. And I think this is an area where the principle doesn't really touch on, but that um, you know the principles can act as like a foundation for these kinds of conversations in the future. Um, I'm gonna bring uh, Vladimir um, back in as well. Um, I'm giving him time to take off his mask uh, <laughs> uh, uh, to talk about, um, just to comment on that also. Yeah, definitely. When we were like uh, seeing all the inputs around discrimination, when we were like uh, seeing these, uh, when we were like trying to get a better understand on how social media companies moderate when it regards to LGBT communities, when it regards to minorities, when it regards to indigenous communities and some other communities that uh, exercise their different rights and that they are using, using social media companies. And the things they are facing in terms of violence, in terms of takedowns, in terms of uh, what they are, are experiencing, there were for sure like this need of better understanding and better uh, knowing how they're taking these decisions. And, and I think in that regards, it's really uh, and particularly relevant, the principle on explainability. But then we have like this uh, uh, also kind of inputs and discussions like what what is like the limit in terms of like do we have really to, to know how social media companies are directly regarding to a specific group or uh, the level of granularity? It was like uh, also uh, considering that this might affect not just those who are uh, uh, impacted by the, by the content moderation, but also, for example, when we were talking about the moderators or if we really need to know the background of the people who is like uh, uh, moderating or conducting the human uh, the human moderation. So I think there were a series of questions in uh, that were relevant to take part on the on the on the conversation, but perhaps also like thinking that how do we move towards a meaningful transparency, which not necessarily means like having more data or more numbers or uh, uh, this this type of information. So I think it was uh, an important uh, discussion, but uh, at the end also like uh, thinking how this is relevant in terms of uh, privacy, in terms of uh, not 
collecting or not enforcing also or requesting uh, not for social media companies and not for also states uh, demanding the information or data from uh, users and uh, from social media companies. So I think it was also an, an important uh, part of the uh, of the discussion and just like to point it out that it's relevant to uh, pay attention on the explainability uh, principles and uh, for sure granu granularity and meaningful transparency, but also uh, in terms of uh, how do we protect also users for, from the uh, information they are uh, providing and all the data that for sure it's maybe part of, of another uh, discussion, but uh, uh, yeah, just to point those, uh, those things. Thank you. And one of the other, whoa, a big camera spin there. One of the, uh, one of the uh, I think it's also important to realize, and this is evident when you read the report, um, is that much of the feedback was not, was also very concerned with um, with online with online harms and with making sure there was integrity in the whole process so that it, when there were user expressed interest that something should be they, they wanted things to be taken down that things were harmful within their community and that they wanted that there to be integrity in that process as well so that the right decisions were were made there and I do think one thing that's noticeable about the Santa Clara principles is that they're in some ways they are, content moderation neutral. They don't come out and say that content moderation should never happen. They recognize that there are situations where uh, companies may well choose, uh, uh, may have good reasons for wanting to uh, remove content or, or limit accounts, um, but they should do so within the human rights framework uh, when, they, when they do. Um, and uh, that was something that, again, was very evident um, in the comments we received. We do have a question. Uh, we have Ofcom in the, in the room, um, and so we have a question from the audience. Yeah, thanks very much. I'm Colin Curry from uh, Ofcom, which is the UK's uh, communications regulator. We'll soon be the uh, online regulator uh, when the online safety bill reaches royal assent some point in the future. Uh, but I just wanted to co-sign everything that everyone said about um, the potential pitfalls of transparency or the potential um, adverse impacts. That's something that we're thinking very deeply about, not least because we are still uh, subject to the general, the prohibition on general monitoring that derived from the e-commerce directive. Um, so I just wanted to, to ask the, the panelists and forgive me, I haven't had a chance to review the report, but I'm very much looking forward to it. If you had come across any kind of suggestions or um, concrete recommendations around um, what I'm increasingly thinking about more qualitative uh, transparency, as opposed to the kind of sheer metrics um, or even metrics that might be um, privacy protecting. So, you know, in Frances Haugen, when she came and spoke to uh, the UK Joint Parliamentary Committee, she made certain recommendations around uh, aspects of transparency that could um, shed light on the content or the processes of platforms without necessarily putting people's user data in jeopardy. So one of the things that she had put up or things that are flying around are this you know, P95, uh, um, so how much hate is the 95th percentile um, seeing, or things like just the, the URLs that are, that are being more shared most often. So I wondered if in the course of the, uh, of the consultations, if you had come across any kind of nuggets like that, because I think that that would be, uh, in addition to the principles and the kind of points of high level consensus, those types of, um, of recommendations would also be particularly useful at this moment in time. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, I, I, I'm 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 not sure off the off the top of my off the top of my head. In in some ways, the so one of the things I think that's a little different than sort of how Ofcom and other regulars would be focused. And one of the reasons I think there was such a strong sentiment to say that the Santa Clara principles are not a template for regulation is that they're very, the transparency is very user focused. It's very much serving, the transparency really serves the purpose and so the users understand and have trust in and believe that their rights are being respected online. And so the, re the, the recommendations really were very much about what we as users, what information we as, as individual users would be helpful for us. Um, and, um, 
and not so much helpful for, it, it's, it's just a, a di different than what I think regulators would want. And I think that was pretty consistent running through, um, running through the comments we received. Yeah, I think, I think when it comes to, to qualitative um, uh, metrics around, like, around content removals in certain categories, I, that's an area that we found to be very difficult, and I'm not sure that I can, you know, in good faith agree with anything Francis Algon has said there. Um, I, I think that, you know, it also, the questions are to how much those benefit users versus regulators, and I think that, you know, we've seen over the years that users benefit greatly from seeing numbers because it helps them make better decisions about platforms. On the other hand, though, we did get some qualitative recommendations um, around some certain other categories. And one of the most interesting ones, of course, is really understanding the role of different humans in the content moderation process. Um, obviously, so much of the content moderation that we see right now is algorithmic, but it was interesting that around the world from different places, um, and I think in the report, we see this from Lawyers Hub in Kenya, from the Montreal AI Ethics Institute, um, wanting to see the, you know, the not just percentages, but also people's, you know, people's backgrounds, their roles in the content moderation process, their professional experience. Are they lawyers? Are they, you know, just low wage workers who are trained, which is most of uh, the, the case at the moment, um, as well as what the policies are for their protection, um, the incentives afforded to them, how their performance is measured and other workplace conditions. And I think that that's an element that's often been left out of this uh, this conversation, because you're right, so much of it does focus on qualitative metrics. Um, and so these were some of certainly some of the most uh, interesting recommendations that we saw that's in the section um, under two due process throughout the content uh, content decision making system. Yeah, and I, I think one what other uh, ones you might want to look to there, um, uh, uh, there was a very detailed submission from um, I from uh, Lapin in um, in Brazil that um, talked about the, the qualitative goal of explainability and proposed an explainability principle, and that's in the report as well. And much of that was pulled out um, into the what became the integrity foundational principle. And I think that would be a place to look as well. And if any of the other uh, co-authors who are on the line <laughs> uh, have an answer, feel free, feel free to, to jump in as well. Um, but barring that, um, we have a little bit of time left, and I think it might be worth spending a little bit more time talking about the specific concerns for um, AI and automated decision making. And so I'm going to ask Richard again to come back on and, and talk about those. Thanks, David. And it may in part help um, respond a little bit to, to Colin's question, I think, because regulators who are perhaps looking more at the systems and the processes that a company uses, which informs its content moderation, as opposed to raw data, sort of the, the, the quantitative metrics. Um, that question around algorithmic transparency, I think is, you know, really is one of the hot topics at the moment. How do we make sure that whether as users or regulators, that we understand how companies are using automated processes and machine learning when it comes to content moder moderation? And how can we have confidence that those systems are being used in ways which are effective, but also human rights respecting. And I think we're gonna, there's gonna be, have to be a little bit of an iterative process and a bit of trial and error in terms of what good transparency in this field looks like. I don't think we can just have you know, code published. Um, I don't think we want to leave transparency only to a very small select group of, of invitees, but that there is something for users as well. But it must be information that is, that is genuinely useful and helpful to them in understanding why a company has made a particular decision. So throughout the, the Santa Clara Principles version 2.0 that you'll see there are a number of references to, to automated processes and almost always the transparency being sought is uh, qualitative rather than quantitative. So it is both an understanding of the circumstances when a platform uses automated processes at all. It is looking at the sort of uh, occasionally looking at numbers but in the sense of what is the proportion of different kinds of content that is flagged or removed that comes from automatic detection rather than uh, uh, user flagging or some other, some other kind of process. Uh, and, and explainability around, for example, and quality control around how those AI systems are accurate. In fact, we say uh, at the very early on in the uh, second um, iteration of the Santa Clara principles, the automated processes to identify or remove content or suspend accounts should only be used when there's sufficiently high confidence in the quality and accuracy of those processes. So 
is automation being used for uh, types of content whereas actually the success rate is very low and how is that being improved over time do you have different success rates for different languages um uh, for example so those are some, i think some of the examples that we've tried to draw into the santa clara principles to try to provide some kind of guidance at this early stage over what good transparency can look like when it comes to the use of algorithms i think it, it's a bit of a cliche to say now um that the covid19 has a sort of crazed crazy created a lot of new challenges when it comes to this space but we do know that the it has accelerated the shift towards automation of content moderation, which was already on a very significant shift, but it's only been accelerated. And so I think understanding what good transparency in this space means is critical. And I hope that this new iteration of the SEPs can be part of that and maybe of some help as well to regulators, even though, of course, our caveat being this isn't a template to be copy and pasted. Thank you so much, Richard, for the extra context there. And I think that that's um, a really, really positive note to close on. Um, we've got just three minutes left. Um, we wanted to share just briefly uh, the list of authors so we can give full credit to the folks who participated in the, the consultation process um, and the writing of the new principles and the report, as well as the toolkits. Uh, there's also some acknowledgements in the report of some of some, not all, of the many people who submitted consultation, uh, or sorry, um, uh, <laughs> provided submissions to the consultation process or participated in one of the online consultations. Um, so many thanks to all of those organizations listed there. I will not read them off uh, because I think you can all find them, um, but thank you to all of our partners. Uh, this was very, very much a collaborative effort um, and we're very happy to see these out in the world. So thank you all for coming. Um, we'll stick around a little bit outside, I'm sure, if you've got questions for us. Um, and I hope that you can find a way to use the principles in your advocacy. Thanks.